So by all means, go check it out, okay? There you go. Watch the court. Let me do that. Good evening, everyone. I am super excited about tonight's speaker. Don is a Florida native, and he's been growing since he was in high school. And he started out with the Brassavola nodosa, which is a rather common, but um, really beautiful and sometimes wonderfully smelly orchid. Um, he has grown almost everything, but his little niche has become the really easy to grow native orchids and some really exotic odd ones, unusual ones. So that's what his topic is for tonight, and I would like everyone to welcome Don. Hi, everybody. So thank you, bear with me. Um, we're gonna try and do a PowerPoint tonight. First one I've done in quite a while. So let's, we're gonna hope it works. Uh, <laughs> my computer was about to die earlier, but we got it plugged in and I think we're gonna be good. Okay. Okay. All right. So what I wanna to talk to you guys about tonight are, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. So tonight I wanna to talk to you about uncommon orchids. Um, most all of you grow you know, lots and lots of orchids. How many grow, how many out there grow something besides Cattleya, Phalaenopsis, Dendrobium? What do you grow? <coughs> what do you grow? Uh, I have an oil and aerophilus Okay, all right, one of the raffle plants. Yeah, okay. awesome, okay. Who else? What do you have? Bulbophyllums and Cassiums. Bulbophyllums are my current obsession. <laughs> Over there. Stanhopeas and um, Coriantis. Stanhopeas, okay. There, we have a Facebook group called the Stanhopea Alliance, which is for Stanhopea, Coriantis, uh, all of the all of the ones that are related to that, uh, Papinias. <clears throat> so join it. There's about five thousand members from around the world. I love them too. I started that group because I love them so much, but they don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> they grow, but they never ever bloom for me. I think it'll keep me away. So, but yeah, so <clears throat> that's what I want to talk to you guys about tonight are some different orchids that you may not see very much of, um, but they're actually pretty easy to grow. <clears throat> so, first of all, who am I? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> as she said, I've been growing orchids for about 35 years or so. My first <coughs> orchid came to me when I was a junior in high school. My track teacher, Mr. Boyette. Gave me a brass bowl and a dozen. First orchid I ever had. Uh, he and his wife, I found out, had about 400 orchids. And so he, it's all his, all of this, it's all his fault. All the tens of thousands of dollars I've spent over the last 35 years, it's all David Boyette's fault. If you see him, tell him. <laughs> so I started that one. That just, I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough. I would buy them. I lived in, in uh, North Florida, Jacksonville at the time. And I started buying and buying and buying and buying. Well, in North Florida, the problem is winter, right? Everything grows great outside during the summer. In the winter time, not having a greenhouse, I had to try and bring everything indoors. And as most of you know, orchids don't really like to be houseplants for the most part. They like humidity, they like water, they like air movement. When you put them indoors for too long, most of them just kind of pout and some of them die. So that was always my problem, but it didn't stop me from buying orchids. <clears throat> so that's how I got started. Um, we started uh, several Facebook groups. I am the owner of a company called Orchids Designs. Uh, we do, I now import rare and unique orchids from all over the place, and I'm a floral designer, believe it or not. So I've been in the floral industry for about 15 years. And I also do uh, floristry for weddings and special events and so forth. I freelance that, but orchids are really my passions. <clears throat> so these are all of my plants, believe it or not. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you guys a couple of the really unique ones up here. <coughs> this is going to work. So. Right here, we have a Phragmopedium. A lot of you guys are familiar with them. Easy to grow. Phragmopediums can actually grow indoors. <clears throat> they can grow fine in the house, as long as they have plenty of light 
They're not terribly fussy. We have a let's see. Here we have this one is called Coriopea predator. This is a Stanopea crossed with Coriandes. And that's just such a cool exotic flower. I really like that. A um, couple of my other favorites in here. This is a Eulophia called Eulophia speciosa. I'm going to talk about that one tonight. I'm going to turn this light off. Oh, there you go. Wow. All right. This is the cute little Bulbophyllum focatum. A lot of you guys might have seen that. It's a fairly common uh, Bulbophyllum. A lot of people grow it. It's pretty easy to grow. Up here we have one of my favorites. This is a, a Bill Tom's hybrid. It's Bulbophyllum Clouds Gold Rush. And I got that from Carl Smith Orchids and I really, really like that one. <clears throat> this one here is a rare species from Australia. This is called Dendrobium jonesii. Uh, it's related to the big Dendrobium speciosum. A little bit different, you can see the flower segments are a little bit longer, so it makes the inflorescence look real shaggy, which I, I like. It's a really, <coughs> really cool looking plant. So those are some of my oddballs. I'm gonna tell you about the four Facebook groups that we started. Obviously the first one is Uncommon Orchids. Mm -hmm. And that one we have about 16,000 members now. Uh, in fact, I have four groups that I founded. We have a combined membership of around 35,000 people from about 160 countries. I don't know what happened. <laughs> What's going on? Let's try that again. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Let's see if we can do that again. I swear that wasn't on the computer. I was looking at the screen and it was not showing. All right, so uncommon orchids. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I also started a group called Grammatophyllums Galore. Now, Grammatophyllums, some of you grow them, maybe. If you don't, I'm going to introduce you to them tonight. They're easy to grow. You can give them a few very simple things. They don't like cold. We'll talk about that a little bit, but they can grow into big, spectacular specimen plants. They're really, really beautiful. <clears throat> so, we also have a group called Growing Big Orchids. Um, I personally love to grow my plants into big specimens. Some of you might have seen this one at the Merritt Island show last year, uh, Platinum Coast Society show. I won a CCE for it, and it won pretty much all of the show awards. Like it won the President's Award and the Candlelighters Award and everything, so it cleaned up. Uh, I've been growing that for about 12 years. <clears throat> and there was no Facebook group like it that I could find, so I decided why not have a group just for people that like to grow their plants up into big specimen plants or they just like to look at them? These are just a few of my monsters. <laughs> we have basically a lot in the bottom left corner. Uh, that one last year, it won a CCM and was awarded an AOS for, uh, excuse me, an AM from the AOS for flower quality. Bottom right corner is my big Dendrobium speciosum from Australia, which is in bloom now over five feet across. I was gonna, I thought for a minute about bringing it tonight, but then when I realized that I have a sports car, and <laughs> there was just no way, it was just too big, but it's in bloom right now. Uh, up at the top, we have Selagini rochicinii. I've had that growing for about seven or eight years, and if you can believe it, I'll talk about this. Um, it grows so fast. It was like a four or five volt division when I got it. And that was maybe eight years ago. <clears throat> in the middle is one of my Bulbophyllum crosses. I have the tail in the back. It's called Bulbophyllum pride of papau. Uh, the smaller, the smaller circle with the big plant is how big they can get. It's a Phalaenopsis cross. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, the fourth group is the Standard <coughs> Airlines, which I told you guys about a minute ago. And I also mentioned that I'm a floral designer for about ten years. So this just a quick run through of some of the stuff I've done in my floral design work. So I like to do unusual. <laughs> Again, I like to do what everyone else is not doing. And that follows through into my love for orchids. I like, I like the unusual ones that aren't the everyday stuff. Uh, all of the 
all the flowers on the right were for an upcoming Netflix TV show, which was really cool working for. I worked on a TV set, that was really nice. <coughs> The highlight of my career so far has been designing at the Oscars. Oh, wow. In 2022, I led a floral design team and we did all the flowers for the Grio Gala, one of the huge Oscar after parties out in LA. Oh, wow. And that was, the, that was the highlight of my, of my career so far. So this is the big floral wall that I did. Yes, I did work orchids into my designs. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Orchids and roses mostly. <clears throat> And I'm told I clean up pretty nice. <laughs> so that was a big honor because we spent all day designing after we actually got to, all of us got to change clothes and actually attend the gala there that night with all the celebs who had just come from the Oscars. So that was really cool. All right. If I was an orchid and you invited me to a dinner party, I would say I come from a big family. There are over 25,000 species of orchids Current count, I think, is around 28,000. This is uh, information from Kew Gardens. Uh, nearly 130,000 hybrids. Guys, that's a huge family. But most of us, as I said a minute ago, most of us only grow a few genera. Most of us don't branch out. We have a few things that we like. You know, we like cattleyas, we like dendrobiums. We don't branch out. So what I want to do tonight is show you some more of what's out there. That you don't have to be scared of. It's actually easy. So here, these are pictures that I just pulled from our Uncommon Orchids group. These have been posted by some of my members. We have a Hafinia up in the upper left-hand corner is my Dendrobium speciosum that's in bloom. Uh, this is going clockwise. We have the green flowers, Oranthes, the cute little Onelia polystachys we have as one of the raffle plants. The Bifernaria we have on the raffle table. Uh, the yellow flowers is, I can never say this quite right, it's rub. R O B E Q, I think I get. <coughs> Anybody know how to say that? Uh -oh. Rubiquita? I can never say it, but I, I like the plant very much. Um, I've seen it too many times. I, I actually grew it years ago, but I had the one that's a red variety. Uh, we have the red flower down here. This is a Bolophyllum hybrid called Rexasa. It's the Carii crossed with Phalaenopsis. Really amazing. <coughs> Uh, we have the spider orchid native to Australia, uh, Caledonia. We have a Huntlia, we have a Telepidon. We have, um, let's see, <coughs> I don't recall the name. Oh wait, here we go. Paphinia, we have Sarcopladus, Bifinaria. <coughs> we have the Huntlia is the flower in our center. That's just to give you an idea of some of the uncommon orchids that are available. Question. No, 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 go back, go back. Go back, go back. Which one? The purple. And the, and the, <coughs> the big one in the middle on the bottom. The Australian spider? This one? No, this one. That one right there. That's a spider orchid, Caledonia from Australia. So it's a, a, really? There's a whole family of them. They're terrestrials, native to Australia. Most of them are critically endangered, but they come in a variety of, of shapes. This one um, is actually one of the least spider. Like some of them have petals that are almost a foot long. Oh. Spectacular. <laughs> I'm trying desperately to find somebody who is who can is authorized to like send a seed pod that I can start growing them in a lab. I want to start growing them. I love them. Um, would you say that the weather here? Pardon? Is, would you say to grow that since they're native from Australia, the weather will be okay? Most tropical? most of Australia has most of Australia, even though they're on the, in the southern hemisphere, they have uh, uh, climate that corresponds to an area in the US. So it's not that different even though they're, you know, they're a world away. Um, like Sydney, for example, has a fairly temperate climate. It's, it's warm temperate, basically, is what they call it. Uh, some of the areas, of course, in the middle of the country are dry, yeah. arid. Uh, out on the west, you have Perth, which is, I have friends who live in Perth and tell me it's a fairly uh, warm city. It's warm most of the time, they rarely get cold. <clears throat> but these guys are found all over Australia, not just in one area. So there's several species throughout the continent. <clears throat> okay. All right. So 
I'm going to talk tonight about easy and uncommon. And these are a couple of the groups I'm going to introduce you to. Uh, Bulbophyllums, the Australian dendrobiums. There's more than just speciosum. There's speciosum, there's tetragonum, which are spidery. Uh, there's kingiaum, which a lot of you have seen. And then the Aussies are taking all of those and they're crossing them all back and forth. So there's so many hybrids available that we just don't get over here. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk about Elophias. Elophias <coughs> are a really cool group of orchids. Most of you, you'll, when I show you the slide, most of you will go, oh, I've seen that little guy. But it's the only one most of you have seen. And Elophia has some beautiful species. Uh, I'm going to talk to you just a couple minutes about some of the map islands that are easy. We're going to talk about some Selogenes and finally some Corianthes. <clears throat> okay, first of all, the Bulbophyllum genus. Uh, most Bulbophyllums come from warm tropical regions. All they need really to be happy is even moisture and warmth throughout the year. They're really not fussy and they're not difficult. Some of them you can even grow indoors, provided you can give them light and humidity. Um, I have a Bulbophyllum uh, Masterianum that grows indoors. Blooms like crazy all summer long. It grows indoors beautifully. It sits right above an aquarium, so it gets lots of humidity. And it's right in a window where it gets some indirect light, and it's happy. <clears throat> um, in general, Bulbophyllums are going to like intermediate light. A uh, little bit more light than a Phalaenopsis, but not quite as much as a Cattleya. In general, the wider the leaves, that's gonna tell you the more light it wants. Um, most of them, if you're gonna grow them indoors actually, most of them need about a 10 degree drop in temperature around bloom time. So it's pretty easy to do just with the thermostat in your home. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but in the daytime, I like it a little bit warmer. At night, I turn it down to sub-zero. <laughs> so that's, that makes the bulb fill and plenty happy and that'll get you lots of flowers. <clears throat> um, just pay attention to when they bloom, uh, what the bloom season is, and adjust your thermostat in your house according, or your greenhouse. You can grow in a greenhouse as well. Uh, you can also grow these outdoors for most of the year. Most all of my bubble fillings grow outdoors all year until it gets down to about 50 or so. And then I, I usually just put them in the greenhouse over the winter. <clears throat> Some easy ones in this group here uh, would be this guy right here, bubble fillum laxatorum. That's an easy little miniature to grow. Uh, bubble fill and bicolor, which is bottom left. That's a very, very easy one to grow. The really spectacular one there over in the top left is a Vacarii hybrid that's called Bulbophyllum, uh, Bulbophyllum bacchinolina. Um, it grows beautiful, huge leaves like Vacarii and big, big, beautiful flowers. That's uh, my plant, actually. Which bloomed for me twice and hasn't bloomed in three years. No. But it's big. <laughs> it grows big and beautiful. It's got beautiful leaves, but there's a little bit of a shy bloomer. <clears throat> okay. Does anybody have any questions on anything? No questions? All right. So, I've already showed you. All right. Next slide. So, this has got a couple of easy ones here, too. Uh, over here on the top left. Most of you are familiar with this one, Bulbophyllum medusa. Pretty easy to grow. Really doesn't need a lot of special care. It likes a warm, moist, and fairly bright shade. Uh, down here, Elizabeth Ann Buckleberry. A lot of you have that or want it. It's a real popular hybrid. <laughs> this is one that I'm working on bringing in from Indonesia. It's a rare red form of a species called Bulbophyllum polystichum, which is normally kind of tan or brown. But in Sumatra, there's this insane, insanely colored red one. And I have a nursery over there that I'm talking to for quite some time that is actually growing them from seed. And I'm working on making that happen. So that's gonna be, and that's what I do. I finally started a uh, business doing that, importing and letting people pre-order because I'm the kind that is an orchid nut. So I would, for example, one of the bubble films I have on the table back there. I saw a picture of it online and said, I want that, I have to have it. Well, nobody over here has it, no one grows it. <laughs> so I spent two years tracking it down. And I finally decided that uh, people, might actually, people might actually want to benefit from all the work that I put in to track these things down. So that's what I wanna do, is I wanna be able to offer orchids that are uncommon, that you can't get here, and that in most cases are easy to grow. 
thing. More bulbophyllums. This one is worth noting here. This is bulbophyllum Mahudii. This is a really rare one. I managed to get one. It took me a while to find it, but I actually managed to get a division from a friend in California. It's a super cool flower. It smells really, really, really bad. <laughs> Somebody asked me earlier, well, did the bulbophyllum stink? And I said, well, you like the smell of a dead body with wet socks? You smell great. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They smell if you're if you're a fly, if you're a carrion beetle, they smell wonderful. They're irresistible. <laughs> so this gives you an example of some of the rare um, hybrids that are available in Asia that I'm working on bringing over here. Um, in fact, all of these are in my last shipment or my my next coming shipment. And that's just to give you an idea of the, the Asians, Thailand and Taiwan, they're doing insane things with bulbophyllum breeding. Um, I wish I wish that there was someone here doing it. <clears throat> but a lot of these a lot of these are gonna be coming here. I'm gonna be bringing them over here. Okay. <clears throat> Our next family is the Australian dendrobiums. Now, most of you are familiar with the Home Depot dendrobiums. Mm -hmm. I call them that because they, they're in every Home Depot and every Lowe's and, and Trader Joe's, the Phalaenopsis type. I'm talking about <coughs> the Australian species and all of their hybrids. These, particularly this one, Speciosum, is almost indestructible. Every, each and every one of you should grow it. It's so easy. <clears throat> this plant sits outside in almost full sun and grows outdoors all year long, all year. It can handle temperatures up in the 90s. It can go all the way down to freezing. My Aussie buddies, I'm a member of several of the Australian orchid groups, tell me that in the bush they go down in the 30s, they get frost on them, and as long as they're dry when that happens, it doesn't bother them a bit. So it is a very, very tough, reliable, durable plant, spectacular in bloom. This is almost five feet across. In so where's a good place to get them? Uh, I know Palmer Orchid has them. Palmer. Oh, in fact, his are coming in bloom right now. He posted a picture on Facebook of some massive specimens that are just coming into bloom. And he does the same thing. His grow outside all year long. He doesn't fuss with them, doesn't do anything. They just grow and bloom. They're spectacular. I see a couple of jaws about to hit the floor. They're spectacular. How do you get it to bloom? Pardon me? Is it to bloom? I do absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So what I do for this guy is in the, after the flower spade, that's when new growth breaks. So when it's got new growth coming, I give it lots of fertilizer, lots of water, and then by that, you know, by that time it's summertime in Florida, you know what our weather's like, we get tons of rain, it's hot as heck, it's very humid, this guy likes that. And then in the winter, the humidity goes down, it's drier because it doesn't rain very much, and we get temperatures falling into the 40s and 50s. That's what makes him bloom. So literally, it's bloomed every single year for me in South Florida for the last six years. In Fort Lauderdale, and then I moved here three years ago, and it just kept, keeps right on going. That is an easy, easy plant. There are nine varieties of speciosum. There's even, if you don't want the huge one, there's a little bit, little bit of compact one. Uh, the variety called pedunculata, which you can sometimes find. It is a uh, small, compact, to about, to about a foot tall, about 12 inches or so, but it has full-size flowers and flower spikes, which is a really, really nice compromise. It's a great plant to grow. <clears throat> this gives you an idea of some of the variety there. Now, these are all my plants. <clears throat> the one on the top left is, I mentioned it earlier, Dendrobium jonesii, similar to Speciosum, but you can tell the flowers are a little bit different. By the way, all of the speciosums are very, very fragrant. And that carries through to most of their hybrids. Um, this guy is this one, that one, and that one are a cross called Hildepoxum, which you can sometimes find for sale here. Uh, it's speciosum crossed with another Australian native called uh, Dendrobium tetragonum, which has real spidery flowers. And again, None of these require any special care whatsoever. Uh, down here we have, this used to be Ductrilia. They've moved it back into Dendrobium now. The taxonomists, you know, they need something to do all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to keep track of them. Uh, now it's Dendrobium willisii. 
uh, Dendrobium white grace is a beautiful, beautiful, stately white Australian Dendrobium hybrid, and it blooms several times a year. It's, uh, it starts Dendrobium, Speciosum, crossed, and I can't remember what else it's crossed with, but it's a beautiful plant. It canes about you know 18 inches to two feet tall, and flower spikes maybe another two feet. Really, really pretty plant. Um, this is uh, Hildepoxum, which is this one, crossed with a speciosum name uh, known as Yondutina. So that's speciosum and tetragonum back crossed to another speciosum. And these are all easy. These look exotic, but they're easy to grow. Again, mine grow and bloom right here. I don't do anything to them. The weather that we have here is perfect for them. They absolutely love it. In fact, um, my Dendrobium jonesi, I have a big special, uh, specimen plant that's about four feet across when it blooms. And my, my buddy Jerry Walsh in Australia, who's seen them in the bush, it's like, that's a spectacular flower. How did you do that? I'm like, I didn't do anything to it. It just it grows and blooms. <laughs> he said it was better than what he usually sees them in the wild. So they really, really like Central Florida. If you have a chance to get some, I would say get them. Is that palm or orchids also? Pardon? Is that a palm or orchids also? I, be I believe, I know he has, I know he has big speciosums. Um, right now, Fred Clark from SBO Orchids has a lot of the Aussie hybrids. Um, but this, and this is to give you an example of some of what's available in Australia. They do a lot of breeding with them. We don't have it here because most of the species we don't have. We, you know, we occasionally get speciosum, we rarely get tetragonum. So there's not as much breeding that happens here. Uh, I'm also working on bringing in some of really, really beautiful hybrids because other than Fred, nobody else really has them here. So these are all hybrids of Dendrobium speciosum crossed with either Kingianum, Tetragonum. Have you seen those on his website? Pardon me? Does he have them on his website, Fred Clark? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. if you go to um, you, you S. You yeah. can see him. Okay. Yeah. If you go to, well, he, he doesn't show, he, show picture, he shows pictures of the parents. Um, each creek, like he lists the cross and he shows pictures of the parents, but not the most of his crosses are not yet bloomed, they're all seedlings. So, part of what I'm going to try and do is bring over seedlings, but I also want to bring over some, some bigger, like bloom sized plants too. Because I'm impatient, I don't like seedlings. <laughs> I want instant gratification. <laughs> uh, the next plant I want to talk to you guys about is Eulophias. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is Eulophia speciosa nicola, and it was grown by my friend uh, Richard Fulford, who got that award, the AMAOS. I have a division of his plant. This is a beautiful African Eulophia. Um, most of you have seen this guy, right? Mm -hmm. It's common around Florida. Uh, I think at last I heard it's all spread all the way up into the Carolinas. It pops up in uh, parking lots. Yeah. in mulch areas. Uh, a lot of people say the seeds come in with mulch, mm -hmm. but it's um, non-native, but it's become very pop, uh, sort of, or very common in the Southeast United States. So you may have run into this little guy. A lot of people think that this is the only, uh, this is what Eulophias look like. <coughs> Having seen the least attractive member of the whole family, <laughs> there's some really, really spectacular Eulophias. <coughs> Are they invasive? Mm -hmm. Pardon me? Are they invasive in Florida? They're, they're not invasive. Uh, currently, I have them in my yard. Yeah, mm -hmm. currently, and I, I looked it up again just to make sure before I did the, the talk, uh, to make sure it hadn't been updated, but they're listed um, as category two uh, on the invasive plant research uh, website by the University of Florida. And category two is non-native, naturalized, uh, but not harming the environment. So I mean, I just they're the here. They're like, in the house yeah, but the window. grass in your yard is also not native in most cases. You know what I mean? Most of what we grow is not native. Right. Um, so as of yet, they've been here for, in fact, I was one of the first ones that found it uh, in Miami back in 2003, I think it was. Um, I was my, my report was one of the only two sightings in the U.S. so far. Um, and I worked a little bit with uh, Bob Pemberton from the USDA Invasive Plant Research Laboratory, because at that time they were still trying to figure out how it got here, how it was spreading, who was pollinating it, you know, what was it doing here, was it going to be a problem, did they need to take action? <clears throat> and I've watched its classification over the years. You'll see people post this online in the Facebook groups, 
and everybody immediately shouts, invasive, invasive, get rid of it. Yeah, it's not. It's no more invasive than most of the plants in your yard. It's That's not causing harm. I've seen it growing in the wild. I've seen it growing in the, you know, in the woods, in the, in the, uh, in the forest. It doesn't cause any problem. And in fact, it often grows where nothing else will grow. A lot of places that I saw back in central Florida were underneath Australian pines. Uh, we haven't seen those really up here in, Florida, in uh, central Florida. In South Florida, that's another invasive species that's taking over. Australian pines drip a toxin out of their leaves onto the ground. And so almost nothing will grow under Australian pines. And these little guys come in and colonize the ground underneath them. So yeah, it's not an invader. You don't have to call them the military or anything. It's, it's not going to be military. <laughs> so again, the genus Eulophia contains some really beautiful species. Um, these are a few that I have. Back up. Gotcha. <laughs> This one? Yes. Yes. Super rare. Eulophia calichroma. Of course. I got, I got a one bulb division. There was only one other dude that I, one other picture I could find on YouTube from one guy uh, who had it. My one bulb division sat for four years, neither growing nor dying. <laughs> no new growth. It didn't die. It just sat there and defied me. <laughs> It finally croaked. I want to find it again. I was really happy, but it, it sprays sprays up to four feet tall with these tiny little quarter inch little dainty flowers. I want to find it again, um, but I may not. I may not get lucky enough to find it again. <clears throat> okay, how are we doing on time? Great. Good. Okay, perfect. We're about a little more than halfway through. So these are some of my, these are some of mine actually. This one over here is a hybrid called Memoria Alexis Pardo. Easy plant to grow. All of these, um, all of these are among the African elopheas, with the exception of Macrobaldi. The African elopheas in general want lots of heat, moisture, sun in the summertime. They go through a very dry winter rest, which is when basically you get to take the winter off. You don't have to do anything with them. Um, my Eulophia petersi goes from October to about February or March with not a drop of water. Not a drop. In fact, if you water it, it won't bloom. <coughs> so they're super easy to grow, particularly the African ones. The ones from Asia, like this one, Macrobulban, are actually easy to grow. Uh, in, in Thailand and Laos, in Vietnam, where they come from, they're used to just a temper, temp, uh, sort of looking for a tropical rainforest environment. So just evenly moist and warm throughout the year, they grow, they bloom, they do their thing. But the African ones are even easier. Now my next group is Grammatophyllums. A lot of you, these aren't really uncommon per se, most of you are familiar with them, but has anybody out here thought about trying them but has been afraid to? I'm trying them, but I can't get it to bloom. I'm can't get it to bloom. What's it doing? It's Is it growing? It's been falling off. I don't know if it was too cold for them. Okay, possibly. Grammatophyllums are divas about the cold. They hate, <laughs> hate the cold. And they will pout, and they will sulk, and they will let you know they're not happy. <laughs> but they're not, they don't die. Um, do, you have, do you have one with broad leaves, or are they narrow? Narrow leaves. Narrow leaves, okay. There's two, they're divided into two basic categories. There's the broadleaf ones, which would be ones like elegans and tiger paw and uh, scriptum uh, and then citrinum. Those are a little bit different than the ones that are cane like. They grow, they look kind of like sugar cane, which sounds like that might be what you have. If you have one of those, they get really big. <coughs> really, really. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but they don't like cold at all. I had one even in South Florida. I had a Grammatophyllum speciosum, which is the largest organ in the world. It's one of the cane type ones. And when temperatures hit 55, it pouted and dropped its leaves. The growing tip on all of the canes rotted off and died, and the cane just stopped growing right there. They hate cold. <clears throat> the broadleaf ones are a lot easier to grow as long as you can keep them warm. I have citrina. 
Pardon me? I have a Katrina. Katrina, mm-hmm. And it's How's it do suffering for you? right now. Pardon? It's suffering. It's suffering? Yeah, but I haven't brought it in either. You have, okay. What kind of conditions does it get? It's under an oak tree, probably needs more water, um, and it's outside. Okay. How big is it? I paid like $90 for so this. It's a good size. Okay. Okay. So generally, and this is true with, you guys know, this is true with most orchids. If they're not blooming, the first thing you always want to look at is are they getting enough light? Because an orchid that's not getting enough light will often grow and be beautiful with nice, shiny, deep green leaves, but it's not enough light to bloom. Are your leaves really green or are they kind of yellowish green? Yellowish green. Okay. So it sounds like you're getting good light. They also need a temperature drop. Do you bring it in or put it in the greenhouse when the temperature gets cold? No. They need a slight drop in temperature about 10 degrees or so. Again, they don't want to get cold, but they want that little bit of variation. I've noticed too the, the day-night cycle. I have some, I used to have some in South Florida that sat where street lights fell on them, and I noticed that at night their, uh, their bloom cycle was off. They didn't bloom at the regular time. So I have some suspicion that they're, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, photolithic or influenced by the day-night cycle. <coughs> so that might be it too. If it's sitting somewhere that night that light falls on it at night, that could be affecting it. I don't I think it got cold and it's probably not getting enough water. Okay. Are your pseudobulbs fat or are they wrinkly? Fat. They're nice and fat. It sounds like everything <laughs> should be right on that. It's cold. I haven't brought it in. <laughs> yeah. If it's again if it's if it's in the cold, it's not gonna bloom because they, they're not where they come from, they don't get cold. So right, if it's getting cold, it's it's sending all of its energy and it's just trying to stay alive. It doesn't have the extra energy to bloom. So that may be what's happening to yours. Okay. <clears throat> um, do keep them warm. But other than that, if you can keep it warm, they're actually easy to grow. Um, These are some common varieties. Of course, this is Citrinum, which mm -hmm. you just talked about. This is the aperture should look like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I will. You can uh, it will. We have Tiger Paw here. This I'll is my big Madagascar elegans. That's a close up of the I'll flowers on Citrinum. <laughs> um, this is uh, Grammatophon and Scriptum, and this is one called um, Jumbo Gram, which is a, a hybrid. It's a hybrid of. Um, Stem, uh, I can't never say the word stem pelifolium, I think it is. It's the one that's pendant, and they made a really nice hybrid out of it. But that's a hanging flower spike. And all of those, again, all those are pretty easy to grow. The broad leaved ones in general are much easier than the cane type. And the cane type gets huge. Oh, wow. Look at that. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that is, that is Grammatophyllum speciosum. This is the largest orchid in the world. Can get canes up to four meters long, at 16 feet long. Okay, about 12 feet long. This is Gramatophyllum melissii. This is another one in the same complex. It's slightly smaller, but not much. <clears throat> um, one of my one of my members in the Facebook group for Gramatophyllum posted a picture of her melissii, and she's standing there, reaching up, touching the flower spike. It's taller than her. But these are beautiful. Here in Central Florida, unless you have a monster sized greenhouse, you're not gonna be able to grow this because you can't keep them warm enough outside. Unless you literally like build a tent around them in the winter <laughs> and heat it. <laughs> but they are nice, they're really nice to look at. Um, this is this is a really rare one. This is Grammatophyllum uh, pantherianum. That's again one of the cane type ones. We never, never see this. Uh, this is the alba form of speciosum. Okay. All right, Selogenes. <laughs> this is a fun family. Yes. Uh, for years, Beautiful. for years, I always thought, and this was back in my early days, I always thought that Selogenes were cool growers, and I could never, ever, ever grow them in Florida. It's just not possible. Because I was looking at, of course, uh, Selogenes prasada, which is a really pretty white one. Crystalline flowers, so pretty. Always wanted it. Didn't even know that there were tropical selogenies that are easy to grow. This one is Rochasenii. You'll see in, in the next slide, it's my plant. Uh, when I got it, how fast it's grown, it grows like a freaking weed. I don't do anything, again, I don't do anything fancy to it. You have a question? 
Yeah, so I have one of those. I didn't know what it was. It, it doesn't grow like weed. Do you have an embark or a moss? I have an embark. Okay. I just I, I discovered with mine, and again, this, this is anecdotal, so I don't say, well, Don said, this is what worked for me. Mine, I noticed that in, because it's been repotted many, many times, this thing will bust right out of its pot and keep going, and it has done that repeatedly. So, it's been repotted a bunch of times. When I had it in bark, and it wasn't staying uh, moist, it didn't grow nearly as fast. When I put it in moss, now it's in a mixture of moss and bark. <clears throat> and lava rock. When I put it in moss and it stayed more moist, it grew a lot faster. Um, my pseudobulbs, you can see, are usually pretty fat. I don't grow it dry, so dry that they get shriveled up, and it seems to prefer that. Um, I give it a time release fertilizer in the spring when it starts to grow. This thing grows all year, though. It never, I've never, no I haven't ever noticed a rest period. It is always growing. <clears throat> is it in their nature to exponentially grow or do you do anything to make it um, it's just a very nature I don't do anything fancy to it it's just it's such a vigorous grower that if it's happy it's, it's going to get big and listen you you've probably seen pictures of these in some of the nurseries in, in Asia where they have them hang and it's just a curtain of flowers <laughs> like you know five six feet long <clears throat> so mine hasn't done that I was just I was disappointed with this bloom <laughs> Okay. <laughs> with 23 flower spikes, I was disappointed with that because I want, I, that for a plant that big, I should have that curtain. <laughs> so I, I can't say that I figured them out 100% yet, but it's, it's doing really well. Do you grow it outside? Yes. So that's where we started in 2017. That's what it looked like. And here we are this year. It just bloomed, it blooms in November. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it grows fast. It grows, and it will, like I said, it will break right out of its pot and just keep growing. There are some other warm growing selogenies that are also pretty easy. Now these take up a lot of room. These are kind of unruly growers. Um, most of you are familiar with uh, Pandorata which they call it the black orchid. It's from uh, Malaysia, I believe it is. And uh, this is a nice, easy grower, just warm, tropical all year, plenty of moisture. It is a messy grower though, because pseudobulbs are not close together. They are on a rhizome that sometimes six or eight inches between them. So you have to have a lot of room or grow it hanging where it can just ramble all over the place. Um, Bufordianzi is a hybrid. Uh, they crossed Pandorata with a smaller, more compact uh, species called Asperata. So Bufordianzi looks almost exactly like Pandorata parent, but it's more tame and a neater plant, more compact. Um, one of the things I like about it is it also keeps the yellow on the lip, which it gets from the Asperata parent. Uh, this is another hybrid called uh, Selogeny South Carolina, which is easy. Um, in general, all these all these tropical, warm growing selogenies are not difficult as long as you can give them good light, warm throughout the year, and most of them like to just stay evenly moist throughout the year. You don't have a pronounced rest period; they're just going to grow all year. Okay, outdoors all year. What? Are you crazy? Yes. So there are some orchids that you can grow outdoors all year right here in Central Florida, believe it or not. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Just to prove you guys, just to prove that it can be done, I'm doing it. Um, I was telling somebody earlier, we were talking about bandas, and I have, I know this is, you're all gonna, you're all gonna cringe when I tell you this. I have a banda that's about six feet tall. <clears throat> the first cold snap we had this year, I forgot to move it into the greenhouse. <laughs> Right, and we went down, if you guys remember our first cold snap, we went down pretty far into the 40s, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Forgot to move it in the greenhouse. And then as I watched it over the next week, two weeks, nothing happened. Yeah, yeah. nothing happened about you. And then we got more cold and more cold, and we got down into the upper 30s once in Kissimmee, mm -hmm. and we've had multiple cool downs, and it's just sitting out there growing like, it's just growing like it's not bothered, I haven't lost a leaf, I haven't had a leaf turn yellow. 
So I think for the most part, most bandas are a little bit more resilient than we give them credit for. Uh, that being said, I wouldn't encourage you to expose your bandas to 40 degree weather. <laughs> but it is, it is possible. <clears throat> it kind of just proves that there's no real hard and fast rules with orchid growing. You know, everything is kind of, every, you know how, you know they all, in Washington, they always talk about fuzzy math? Fuzzy math, it just like, numbers don't quite add up. So orchid growing is a lot the same way. It's, it's, the care requirements are kind of fuzzy, right? It's what works for you. So some of you may try, like, you know, this lady has problems with the granophyllum scriptum. You may just be, sometimes if you have a plant that's not doing well, if you move it just a couple of feet, sometimes just a couple of feet into a little bit different light or a little bit different microclimate is all that it needs. So if your plant's not happy, just move it a little bit. See if it likes, maybe it doesn't like where you have it. And that's part of it too. And then once you find a place where it's happy, leave it alone, yeah. let it grow. Long time ago, uh, an orchid grower that I looked up to when I was back in my early days, uh, I remember a couple of words from him. And he said, the best way to care for your orchids is benign neglect. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean ignore it. Mm -hmm. That means, you know, take care of it, but for the most part, don't fuss over it. Just let them grow. These things grow in nature. They grow, I have a, a photo that one of my Aussie friends sent me of uh, Dendrobium speciosum growing on a uh, five meter rock pillar on the top. No soil, bare rock, full sun. So orchids are tough. Don't fuss over them, don't baby them, don't pamper them. Usually they do fine. Do you use fungicide or anything like that? I, yeah, not as much as I should, but yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I also have found that if I have if I have some kind of rot starting, I'm more of a fan of uh, natural rather than chemicals. So my first my first try is usually to cut away the rot and treat the cut edge with cinnamon or cinnamon paste, because usually that will take care of it. More advanced, yes, I might go to I may go to a chemical, but I like to try more natural things first. Um, and cinnamon has worked well for me over the years. I buy cinnamon like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> The <laughs> cinnamon is a desiccant, but it also has uh, antimicrobial properties. Yes. Why, why do you mix your cinnamon with orchid paste? Well, I, I just I usually dab it onto the cut edge because the cut edge of a yeah. leaf or a bulb is moist. Um, some people mix it with a little bit of glue, like Elmer's glue, yeah. to make a paste, yeah. and kind of paint it on. Uh, but I've also found that if you use too much, you can dry the plant out because sure. it is a desiccant. So I use just dab along the cut edge where it's moist. And that's all I do. And that also allows the cut edge to heal, and then eventually that washes away. You know, it gets rained on and washes away, it doesn't stay there. <clears throat> okay. This is some of the ones you can grow outdoors in Central Florida, starting with our beloved little Florida butterfly orchid, Encyclia pempendus. Now, this guy is one of my favorites. It's so cute. You can find it all over Central Florida. In fact, <clears throat> they're found even a little bit, even a little bit north, not quite as far as North Florida, but even a little bit north of here. We're, we're not quite at the northern end of, end of their range here. All over Florida, um, interesting like I've also found that individual plants from different areas of the state have slightly different flowers and a different fragrance, which is really unique. But yes, they're all fragrant, they're all easy to grow. <clears throat> and if you can find them, Get one. They're native. Put it outside. You don't have to do a thing in the world to it. Let God take care of it. Does it grow on the ground or in a pot? They grow, well, they're epiphytes, so you could grow it mounted. They prefer to grow mounted, so you can mount it on, you know, a slab of tree fern or a piece of driftwood or something or a piece of cork, but they like to grow mounted. I've seen people grow them in pots, but tempenzas usually, I, where I've seen them grow, <clears throat> usually when I see them in the wild, they're not on the top of a branch, or usually on the side or on the underside hanging down. <clears throat> this is uh, right down the street from where I live. This is uh, Sheeple Creek Park, and the trees are just loaded with them. And about June, you can go walk through the park, and they're everywhere, everywhere. I've even seen a couple of albas following that in the trees. Fast. Uh oh. 
mouse is running away, I need a cat to chase it. Uh, Phaeus is another easy to grow orchid genus that will grow outdoors perfectly happy, right here in central Florida. In fact, that's my sitting, I kind of sunk the pot into the ground a little bit so the roots can come out of the bottom and go into the soil if they want to. And they're all in spike right now. I have about six plants all in spike. I haven't done a thing in the world to them to protect them from the cold. They're perfectly happy. And they grow and bloom all year. Friends of mine in South Florida grew them outdoors all year long. South Florida gets down to about the same temperatures we get here. It's not really that much warmer. South Florida can get temperatures in the 30s. Occasionally, not as often, but still. So these guys are perfectly happy outdoors and there's several hybrids, varieties, species to choose from. All right. This is one of my favorite, favorite orchids. If you can find one, go get one. Go get one. They're so cool and so easy. This is Yolophia Peter's Eye. This is one of the African Yolophias that I mentioned to you earlier. <coughs> Look at the flowers, they're beautiful. Very light fragrance. This is a true succulent orchid. This is native from Africa through the Arabian Peninsula and they grow in very dry, arid areas. They'll often grow on exposed rock faces. They'll grow in the desert, literally in the desert. Uh, and the blooms last year, for me, they topped 12 feet tall. 12 feet on a compact plant that's not even 18 inches. So if you want something spectacular, you don't have a lot of room, this is a great plant because for most of the year, it's a small, compact plant, and when it blooms, it'll knock your socks off. And it's easy. <clears throat> A lot of people, uh, a lot of people grow this. A lot of people that grow like cactus and succulents. You can see them for sale uh, at cactus and succulent shows. Mm -hmm. A lot of succulent nurseries have it for sale also because those folks like to grow it, but they never bloom it. Um, and I figured out the trick about five years ago, which is it needs a dry, completely dry winter rest. And this is why I said this is an easy one to grow from about October through February, even into March, not a drop of water, not a drop. In fact, if you water it over the winter time, you get lots of new growth in the spring and no flowers. So it's like, it's like you get a vacation from your orchid growing. So yeah. you go on vacation and just forget about it. How do you know what's the top of I usually, I usually, as new growth, because new growth matures late summer, early fall. So when I just know from years of growing it, that's about, about the time that's ready to shut down and go to sleep. Uh, in the springtime when it wakes up, I let the plant tell me when it's ready to go. So what will happen in spring is when it wakes up, you'll see that it starts to initiate new spikes and new growth at the same time. Um, when they first come out, you can't quite tell which one is which. So I usually wait to start watering mine until I can determine which is which. And once I know I have flower spikes underway, then I start watering and feeding it again. So yes? even though we do get some rain over that period, do you bring it inside then, or do you cover say, it? Say again? Since we do get rain in that October to March period, do you bring it inside, or do you You can, it? you can, yeah. Uh, what I do for mine is I've got a nice big overhang that's that's in the sun, but it protects it from most rain. If we get, if we get a big storm, it may get a few drops blowing on it. But for the most part, it's able to get full sun and a little, it stays pretty dry and it still blooms. A little bit of water isn't gonna throw off the blooming cycle, but too much water will keep it from blooming. Um, and there was something else I was gonna say and I totally forgot. Uh, I'm one of the first people I think to successfully cross this with Grammatophyllum. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, they're in the same tribe and no one has done it. If you look on uh, AOS, I think maybe there was one, one cross, one hybrid. Um, and on the RHS, it's not been registered. So I crossed this with chromatophyllum scriptum, and I have pods going to flask now. Really interested to see what those will look like. But this, this out of all the ones I showed you tonight, if you have a chance to find these, get one. They are so cool. <clears throat> Even if you never bloom it, it's just a cool looking plant. It's super easy. 
And now my Australian dendrobiums. Again, these are easy to grow. Fragrant, highly fragrant, beautiful flowers, easy to grow. Uh, I told you about the conditions that mine gets at home. I don't do anything to it. This is that picture I was telling you about. That's about a 60 foot rock pillar. And up at the top, in full sun, no soil at all, it's crowned with species. Right, it's just out in the bush in Australia. Um, several forms, this is Jack. <laughs> Jack the Tabby, uh, I call, sometimes I call him Ferdinand, after the bull in the children's story because Jack likes to smell my Oregon flowers. This one, <laughs> the uh, Bulbophyllum, he went up to it, he smelled it, and kind of sprinkled his little nose, but he was curious, and he went back and he smelled it again, he decided he didn't like it. <laughs> this one, I, this is a golf green hair pig, and I caught him several times up there sniffing that one, so he must have liked that one. Uh, he also knows how to use Alexa. <laughs> um, also, outdoors, soft hay dendrobiums. A lot of people don't think about these. You can grow these on your trees, folks. You can put them on your trees in your yard. They need the winter cool down in order to set flower buds. They need a cool, dry winter to bloom. We have perfect conditions here. So, like, Cariardi, uh, Anosmum, Superbum, a lot of those varieties will grow right outdoors with a very minimum of care. If it gets too cold, you know, throw a blanket over them or something, but for the most part, you can grow them outdoors all year. Even the Nobile type dendrobiums, I've grown that outdoors here without any trouble. So, and these, as you can see, I mean, these are just spectacular. There's a, a, a botanical garden down in Fort Lauderdale, or Miami actually. Um, in Cora Gables. They have uh, pendulous dendrobiums growing on all of the trees throughout the gardens, and they're just spectacular when they're blooming, just curtains of flowers hanging from the tree branches all throughout the park. Yes? All my dendrobiums, including my nobleas, and uh, I mean, sorry, not nobleas. All my dendrobiums go into my carport around November. Mm -hmm. Last year I had about eight of them in, in bloom at the same time in the yep. spring, and I can't wait for this year. That's great, and that's that's a key, keeping them dry. Yeah. Keeping them dry and cool. Um, in, in nature, they usually grow on deciduous trees. So what happens is they get a lot of heat and moisture in the summertime, but they're shaded. When the leaves are out, they're shaded. Uh, in the fall and winter, the trees, their host trees that they're on lose a lot of their leaves, so they're used to higher light levels in the winter, but cooler, drier conditions. So if you can replicate that, you're gonna get lots and lots of flower spikes. If you water them too much in the winter, again, this is another one that won't bloom if you water it too much. So that concludes my talk. Q and A. Anybody have questions, comments? So yes. the big ones that you showed us, and you said that they they propagate not propagate, but they they like to grow. Have you done it terrestrially where you just do the whole little ground which, and which, just uh, Grammatophyllum, any of the big ones? Grammatophyllums, uh, I have speciosum. Grammat the big one that I showed you, which is man standing there, that grows in the ground. In Singapore, they, they use it as a landscape plant. Okay. So it will grow in the ground. Um, it's technically not a terrestrial, it's an epiphyte. They, uh, they naturally occur in trees, but it's perfectly happy growing on the ground too. I've seen them many places in Hawaii. There's some growers in Hawaii that have them just in the, on the grounds of their nursery. They seem perfectly happy to grow on the ground too. They can, they can grow in a greenhouse. If you have a greenhouse big enough, a lot of botanical gardens across the country have it in their collection, they grow it in a greenhouse. So if you have a greenhouse big enough, you can grow it in a greenhouse. But it will get big, really big. Really, really, really big. Is Anybody it else? Fairchild you were talking about? I'm sorry? Fairchild Gardens? Yes, thank you. Fairchild, that's it, yes. I don't know why I went blank. I went to that place for 22 years. Yeah. <laughs> I used to go all the time. Yeah, Fairchild, yes, that's it, thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Do you grow any Catacium? I have, I don't currently, but yes, they're also easy. Easy, lots of water and food when they're growing, and again, a dry winter rest. A lot of growers even will just turn the pots over on their side in the winter so they don't get accidentally watered. They're easy. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, that um, that Yolothea Petersi, pardon? Uh, that Yolothea Petersi that yeah. you showed. When it comes out of dormancy, how much water does it need? I usually start once <coughs> once I can tell the difference between my new growth, my flower spikes, and I know I have flower spikes underway. I'll start watering as normal. Um, like in the fall. A lot of water. Just I'm, I soak it pretty good the first time because it's been yeah. dry for like five months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they, I've also, you know, they get tons of rain in the, in the summertime. Okay. Never had a problem with rot. They take it, they just keep okay. on going. I grow it in a cactus mix with some additional pebbles just to help aerate the soil a little bit more. That's another one that it grows so robustly, it'll break out of the pot and keep going. It's a, it's a really, really good plant. Great, thanks. Yep. Well, that's, that's about it. Uh, in closing, just remember, uh, if you want to take a picture of the screen there, those are the four groups on Facebook. We have Uncommon Orchid, which is this you? one. Uh, <laughs> Santa Fe Alliance, Gravata Pylons Galore, and Growing Big Orchids. Thank you. And that's it for me, everybody. Thank you so much. Go out and try some new things. Thank you. Take a picture. <laughs> I can unplug it now. It's not going to matter. <laughs>